Okay, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Farrell, and I am with uh, Legal Managed Services team at Thomson Reuters. I will uh, be your host for today's webcast. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items I would like to cover. We will be answering your questions today. Uh, to submit a question, please go to the Q&A panel. This can be found either at the bottom corner of your screen or if you are viewing in full screen in the floating toolbar at the top of your screen. Simply select the drop down to access it, type your question, and select all panelists to ensure that your question is visible to all of our panelists and the event team. Today's webcast will be recorded and you will receive an email later this week with a link to view the recording and a copy of the presentation. We have a lot of material to cover today, so I'll now pass the presentation over to our moderator, Dave Curran, Global Director, Risk and Compliance at Thomson Reuters. Thank you, Alex, and thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, this is one in a series of conversations we're having uh, on the bigger theme of the collision between big data and big compliance. And today we're going to talk about the people, process, and technology solutions that uh, folks we've been talking with uh, are really looking to learn more about. Uh, I'm Dave Curran, um, and I'm with Thomson Reuters. I'm going to be moderating. This is a jam-packed session. We're going to try and put a lot into this, so take a deep breath. Um, the materials will be available to you um, online, so you don't have to take uh, detailed notes. Our goal really is quite simple. We want you to come away from this session with something really tangible. Um, you know, it can be one or five things that can help you mitigate risk and do your jobs um, as senior risk and compliance and legal folks effectively and more effectively. Um, to do that, I wanted to provide just a little, a couple minutes of context, and you see a slide, where's the magic bullet? Um, this comes out of um, a number of in-person sessions. We've had big groups at Google and at Northern Trust and in, uh, in San Francisco, as well as literally dozens of meetings with companies um, around this subject of the challenges associated with, with big data. And um, we've had a lot of hours of discussion about the challenges. Today, um, we're going to only touch the tip of the iceberg of some of the solutions. But um, I want you to feel free to submit questions, as Alex said. This is a conversation. We have a bunch of slides, but I want this to be interactive. And um, raise your questions, and we'll try and get to them either here or certainly immediately following the meeting. Um, as I said, we've met with dozens of folks, your peers, and there are several takeaways, and this is probably over well over 100 people in person. You're not alone, um, and in fact, in the world's leading technology companies, um, just like folks who may have not have as big a budget in technology and are not technology-based businesses, are struggling with what to do in legal and compliance functions uh, in relation to data and analytics. Um, the other is, uh, uh, Danielle, if you go back to the, the, to the magic bullet slide, um, everybody wants a magic bullet. <laughs> in fact, when we started it our, with our good friends at Google at that meeting, um, everybody said, we, we want a dashboard, uh, a tool that gives us everything. And this is a slide that's been circulating on LinkedIn, and, and uh, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, you can't, I'm sure you can't read it, which is part of the point, I think. Um, and this deck will be available, so you'll be able to see that if you haven't seen the slide already. There's a lot out there in what people call big data. And what it, one of the things we struggled, have struggled with in discussions is nobody can agree on a definition of big data. And I'm a lawyer, and other lawyers tend to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that definition is. Um, if there's anything we've learned from our discussions, uh, that it's, it, it defies definition, and we can't get caught up in that perfect world. We're trying to figure out as lawyers, as compliance professionals and, comp and risk professionals, how to deal with this data, how to deal with the ecosystem and get problems solved because your bosses don't care, your stakeholders don't care if and you haven't you've yet to come at the perfect solution. So we're going to do that today. Um, we want to make sure that in your role, everyone understands that you have to do something. If there's any, anything that's come out of the discussions we've had, and I'm sure we'll continue to have, is the status quo is not enough. The big data, we're surrounded by big data, big data engulfed by it, um, and simply doing nothing when you're awaiting the magic bullet is not a sufficient answer. So uh, the other thing is that we would all love um, a simple technology solution to this, the, the magic bullet. Um, 
What we found in working with clients through real data issues um, and the legal and compliance ramifications is that it's a combination of people, process, and technology at this intersection of data. And so that's the, the sort of middling to bad news. The good news is that Thomson Reuters um, and our partners, two of whom have joined us today, uh, Digital Reasoning and Neotologic, um, are working right now to harness people, process, and technology to address these critical um, aspects of, of the big data challenges. And, and so, uh, Daniel, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, quick overview then. I've given you the context. We're going to, um, I'm going to hand this off to Danielle Hoagland, my colleague, um, a fantastic lawyer and problem solver. Um, she and Ryan Mann from our group are going to talk about some legal managed services solutions that we've got out there. Uh, then on, um, our, our colleagues from Thomson Reuters, Amanda DuPont and Mark Winders, will talk about a couple of specific solutions that we have. Um, I'll then uh, pause there for some Q&A, and then we'll move right into uh, Stephen Epstein, who um, is a terrific guy, VP of Marketing for Digital Reasoning, um, an artificial intelligence machine learning company um, dealing with communications, e-communications and others. Um, fascinating stuff that is leading edge. Um, and similarly, Matt Gillis, um, who is the president of Neotologic, will walk through some of the things that he's solving. Um, and he's got a tremendous uh, background in the space, a lawyer as well. Um, so we've got a jam-packed session. Um, again, uh, thank you to everybody, for everybody to joining. Thank you for the folks. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Danielle to uh, start talking about some of the solutions. Thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> and I uh, apologize in advance for the frog that I have in my throat. Um, and thanks to everybody that we have on the line for your time and interest. As Dave mentioned, this group has talked a lot about how technology can be deployed to make sense of big data and to put it to work in a proactive fashion within the compliance function. Um, but, <clears throat> and I promise we'll get to a, a lot of that today, but before we do, we're going to talk about hey. <laughs> and I'm going to give everyone a little lesson in hang. Um, so this actually is my farm in Washington State, just north of Seattle. And we have about 50 acres. <clears throat> and every summer, we have to bring in the hay. It's a huge job, uh, even for the relatively small farm that we have. And as you can see, there's, it's basically, you know, hay is just tall grass that grows. Um, and this is our brand new, as of 20, 2014, John Deere tractor. And by the way, that's my kid. Um, he was about two and a half at the time. Um, so this John Deere is the top of the line for its class and its size. It has a front end loader, which you can't really see in the picture. Um, it has four wheel drive. It has the works. If it had air conditioning or if air conditioning was available, we would have had it. Um, we also have a monster of a mower and a John Deere baler. So we have all the technology we need to bring in the hay, and then some. But the hay isn't, gonna, or the tractor isn't going to drive itself without the right operators, people, process, and technology at work. By the way, that's my dad actually bringing in the hay. Um, without the right operators and a solid process, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. The the machines would be sitting uh, in the barn. Um, under a tarp, and they would be, should be sitting there not working for us at all. So first, you need to know the fundamentals, what the tools are and how they work together, how to drive the tractor, how to attach and detach the various equipment of components. So in the screen you see here, that's our baler, and it's attached to the tractor, and it's actually a pretty complicated process to figure out how in the world that attaches. Um, how to string the baler with bale. Uh, the baler is a very complicated piece of equipment. Um, you have to string um, uh, string the twine through the, the baler so that it knots automatically. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty manual process to get everything to work together. Um, and before you cut a blade of grass, you need a plan. You need to know the land. You need to know where the rocks are. You need to know where the dips are. You need to lay a path uh, that you're going to follow and maintain that path because it's all about the consistency of the rows you cut. The tighter the rows, the more hay you'll pick up, and you don't want to leave bales sitting in the field because then you lose money. 
So once you have these foundational elements in place, you hop in the saddle of that John Deere and go for it. People, process, and technology. It's everywhere. It's across industries. And that's our philosophy at Legal Managed Services. So in a nutshell, we, ho we help corporate legal departments uh, or corporate legal and compliance organizations build that solid foundation upon which uh, to deploy a tech solution effectively. And this arises in a number of contexts. Um, it arises in the regulatory and change management context, governance solutions. Um, so here on your screen, these are some of our service offerings uh, in the, the risk and compliance arena. So regulatory mapping, which my colleague Ryan is going to speak to in just a minute, regulatory research and monitoring, uh, corporate governance services, and business intelligence. These are all services that our team of <clears throat> literally hundreds of attorneys um, can, help, uh, can help you tackle compliant, your compliance issues. Um, we have smart people that help compliance groups get their house in order in a systematic and process-driven manner and make big data actionable for the organization. Um, so a good example of how this all works together in the compliance function is in the regulatory change management context, um, which is a foundational element to any compliance program. Uh, you can have the most sophisticated technology around, for example, the John Deere tractor, but to what end if the data being collected and analyzed doesn't track the latest regulatory scheme? So think updated reporting obligations. And at this point, I'm going to hand the mic over to Ryan, uh, my colleague in Minnesota, to talk about how reg, ma reg change management works within the compliance function and what we have to offer within that context. Thank you, Danielle. And speaking of big data and uh, reporting and tracking requirements, here's one example. Uh, an esteemed TR uh, colleague um, recently uh, started offering the, the quote that about every 12 minutes in the U.S. there there is uh, a regulatory alert. Uh, back in 2008, that number was more uh, more towards 10 a day. Uh, and as many of you know, that number has consistently uh, continued to explode throughout the last eight years. And we can see here in 2014 and, and into 2015, that number escalated uh, as far as the, the global regulatory alerts uh, north of 200 a day. Uh, so it really truly is the definition of big data coming at us each and every day. Uh, you know, and, and obviously these changes can range from the very minor to uh, very substantive, uh, including in Dodd-Frank, Dodd Volcker rule, et cetera. Uh, so it really exemplifies the importance of a comprehensive uh, reg change management program. And as we consider that reg change management program, it really, uh, uh, is a front end to, to back end comprehensive um, um, program all the way from that content that you may receive from Thomson Reuters uh, or other providers out in the market all the way ultimately to to reporting and, and truly reporting is everything. Uh, these uh, seven, seven chevrons help lay out the beginning, middle, and end of a process obviously many of you are familiar with uh, with respect to GRC uh, and you can receive uh, th that content in many ways, uh, the applicability or the uh, legal inventory uh, can can be done and is is, is extremely important, uh, but ultimately the the uh, mapping of that legal inventory to the to the risk taxonomy of your organization are really going to help make the rest of the uh, four sh chevrons really sing and offer you an ability to uh, utilize things like automated platforms, whether that be from from Thomson Reuters or or many of the other um, offerings in the market uh, and allow your organization to to mobilize that automation and really make that content actionable. 
so obviously this this really gets into the heart of uh, how your organization is structured, your lines of business, etc., uh, and and really does get detail oriented. Uh, and once mapped, uh, here we we have a very brief example of of a particular uh, rule uh, that is that is in effect being mapped to the risk taxonomy of an organization. Uh, and clearly, we, we all understand, uh, you know, that 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 rules and, and alerts are um, flying at us uh, pretty regularly, uh, and reg mapping helps us deal with that regulatory change. Uh, whether it's the FCC or Federal Reserve uh, sending out uh, alerts or, or updates, uh, mapping allows your organization to t take those changes and ensure they're in the hands of the correct stakeholders internally. Uh, and as, uh, as Ryan, we, yep. Ryan, this is Dave. Just let me jump in for just a question that we had. Um, so, so if I'm not a I'm not a large bank, um, I still need to contend with changes, correct, um, that are coming at me from a both a regulatory and statutory standpoint. So, if I'm a lawyer or a compliance person, I have to figure out a people, process, and technology way of dealing with this, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think in I think many of us uh just in in recent weeks, uh you know, if if your uh roles your role or responsibilities overlap in any way with with data privacy, right? And 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 you know, developments with with privacy shield, uh there are, you know, updates and alerts coming from the the EU Commission, among many others, uh, just inundating us uh, with with information. Uh, it just as as one simple example, uh, and ultimately, it really does, to Danielle's point, take the the uh, people uh, manually mapping uh, all of that that content, that legal inventory to the to the risk taxonomy of your organization, no matter how complex um, or or incomplex uh, that may be. To, to make the rest of your your compliance program, any automation you want to do, uh, take that and really make it sing. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was really helpful. Um, and now we're going to move to uh, my colleague, Amanda DuPont, who's going to talk about um, <clears throat> The PR due diligence suite, the, the legal due diligence suite um, that we partner with, uh, with at TR Legal Managed Services, we partner with our uh, colleagues and other companies to provide the people and the process to their content and technology solutions. Um, so Amanda, we'll turn over the mic to you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, you're going to be moving through the slides, right, Danielle? I'll just say yeah, that. Yeah, ma'am. All right, perfect. Well, this is going to be a pretty high-level look and just talk about risk at a different level, not the regulatory mapping that you just heard about, but really more importantly, uh, getting more in the probably the crux of big data. Can you look at data today and see risk? And do you have ability currently in the systems you're employing for doing due diligence faster, smarter in light of technology tools? And at a lot of levels um, we're known for our legal solutions, but at the same token, I think people have to recognize the information component to what Thompson Reuters delivers today. And I, I work in our new product development side of that information space, so I really can tell you kind of what's coming down the pipe, uh, the exciting things we're building, and really can you see risk faster? And I always like by just starting the conversation really with the lawyers in general. Uh, your due diligence process, what are you doing today versus what you did even five years ago? Uh, versus, God forbid, what you learned in law school, it's it's changing so fast that you have to be staying ahead of the technology in this particular realm. More importantly, the regulators are expecting, uh, I don't care if you're a two-person AML department at a bank or you're a large multinational business or you're just a startup, uh, the same rules apply to everyone and really technology is quickly changing in this space most rapidly from my perspective. So I wanted to share kind of what's available um, especially in light of kind of following up with your last webinar or meeting, you know, what could you look at for tools today to start addressing kind of the collision of big data and big regs? So two things I'm thinking of as I wanted to show you kind of brief looks at product lines that probably tap into things you haven't even recognized we're doing. But there's a date I always, when I speak, I speak at a lot of events, 
um, I throw one date out there because I think it's such a tipping point for all of us in the technology sector to think about. June 29th, 2007, write it down. It doesn't seem that long ago, really. Um, it is actually eight and a half years ago. But that's when the first iPhone launched. Uh, so much has changed just from that mobile, you know, eight and a half years ago, thinking in our own lives, what we do, banking to calendaring to, frankly, discovery issues, um, but just how fast eight and a half years has changed things. And so really, I always just try to remind anybody taking a look at technology tools and the processes and the people it takes to do this today, um, you owe it to yourself to realize, you know, eight years is a long time in this particular type, uh, information age we live in. So I just like telling people as a lawyer myself, someone who did um, work that is very much probably more machine than anything today um, when I first started. Take a look at what technology can do, and then you have ways to fill in the holes. So from a, let's just talk about internal policy regulatory landscape mapping to risk sitting in-house, whether it's, uh, you know, the alphabet suit of regs you sit with from foreign corrupt practices and knowing your customers and preventing money laundering to just internal uh, fraud happening internally to high-risk entities and in, in countries you may be dealing with. Um, we're going to jump to the next slide, and I'm just going to say, I think this one's just kind of explaining our philosophy here at Thomson Reuters. Essentially, could you have a no-holes approach to doing that compliance and due diligence work? Really, we probably do offer that particular type of solution. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what your peers do today. If they're using technology as their step one, and then from there going in and filling out the holes, what does that look like? So really, one of the most important things to realize if we jump to the next slide is we do, in, in fact, it's probably what we spend most of our time on right now on the information side, is is there a way to find risk faster? And what does risk look like? And from our perspective, I'm talking about the ability to tap into live information on people and businesses. So whether it's the fact that someone filed bankruptcy, whether they filed a new address, frankly, whether they have a fake identity, whether they died, there's many pieces of public records that can identify risk immediately that we can deliver up. For our businesses, it's the fact is we probably look a lot of times at, you know, is the company legitimate? Is it a shell? Is there beneficial ownership ability to tap into? There's many pieces public records can instantly analyze and deliver. Clear is one of our main platforms for doing this today. And so if we jump to the next slide, one of the things that is hard to see here, and obviously this is a high-level discussion of technology tools and processes others are doing to give you some insight as to how to move forward in such a fast-moving area, but one of my favorite things to think about and what we've been doing and spending a lot of time in is making the connections to risk you might not have identified. We do it in a lot of ways in a lot of different parts of Thompson Reuters today. Um, but one of my favorite areas that I want to show you in your head to think about, because we're not really showing products here, is what if you could look at a business and quickly see right behind that business who owns it, who's tied to it, um, if it's a person, vice versa, could you kind of see who's under the hood there? And then what if you could vet all of those particular entities and people against risk factors, anything from being on a watch list, a heightened watch list, to being under active investigation, to having fraud-based criminal activity, to bankruptcies. I mean, there's lots of um, pieces we can identify, and we are doing that real time. So one of the things, as we jump to the next slide, is just understanding technology today in the due diligence arena can quickly pinpoint risk. And then the processes that um, many are employing today as they're you know, using systems to look for risk, is they can also fill in the holes. So maybe that means court running in Canada to make sure jurisdictions that aren't online are fully um, processed. So even having a consistent process to look at a subject and then fill in holes, that really is how I'm seeing things change here, where it's pretty easy to have a, a technology step one, and the step two is making sure there's an ability to fill in holes if they exist. So as we come to Amanda, the end Amanda, of this, this is Dave. Yeah, just yeah, to jump in, yeah. jump, jump in for a second with a question that I've heard a lot from folks Absolutely. is how does this, how, how would a client, a company come to you with this kind of big data challenge? What is it, what is the typical scenario for somebody who arrives sure. on your doorstep needing help? 
Well, it's it's a variety of um, applications. Often it's vendor vetting. Maybe they need to look against their customer base. They have to, a duty to know their customers, whether it's U.S.-based, international, but no one can be working with known terrorists and um, money launders, et cetera. So there's reasons in that particular capacity. Often it is in, certainly in the, the financial applications of really kind of knowing and your customer who they are. Um, other applications, and, and it's quite varied. I could be in, in an internal investigation with a large insurance company that, um, you know, believes there's internal fraud happening and needs some ability to do research in that manner. So really it, it turns on the type of, um, is there a need to see public records information on a person or business? And because it's so varied, anything from, you know, verifying an identity to possibly getting a full due diligence report, um, you know, it has many applications in truth. But our, our wheelhouse really with lawyers and our legal departments is probably that investigation component they're doing today for due diligence purposes. Right, and you've underscored one of the themes from our big data discussions that I'm sure the audience has experienced, and that is in, in addition to internal, as you've mentioned, the ticking time bombs within your enterprise, it's also um, the supply chain. Perhaps the single biggest absolutely. big data challenge is the supply chain, no? Yes, absolutely. And um, I think it leads to simply, if you thought, you know, there's really not a way to tackle this thorny issue. Um, you know, just today or just this week, we see SAP, you know, SAP is doing a settlement for Foreign Corrupt Practices Act um, out of Mexico. The reality is, you know, having the ability to vet who you're doing business with wherever you are externally is is a growing area of regs as well as, you know, liability. All right, well, I Great, think thanks. we can probably, yeah, I think we, you're seeing just some screenshots. That's enough to probably annoy everyone just seeing PowerPoint. Um, you know, I apologize for that. One thing I want to stop uh, on right here, and then I, I think I'll be at the end of my particular piece, but um, a really fun area I got, I've been working with is uh, visualization, being able to quickly visualize connections and going 10 degrees out. For instance, the FBI is a very big user of our clear technology, which is the public records uh, software you're seeing up on the screen. Uh, but even while government investigators may use this, I might have a fraud investigator at any level suddenly finding the connection, the needle in the haystack through quick clicks of the mouse and having a connection that they just didn't know existed. And the kinds of things I hear when I show just what you can do instantly today is things like, uh, that was six weeks of time savings, not minutes, not hours, but weeks. And so just, you know, get used to the idea that if you haven't spent some time understanding how quickly uh, someone like Thomson Reuters in particular has probably solutions to start looking to risk that sits in your organization, uh, we definitely would welcome. There's many avenues to the business here, but chances are we're either building it or have it, and we'd love to talk deeper on this particular piece. So. I think that's the end for me, Danielle, and I'll, yes, the lovely slide. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you big, so much, Big Amanda. data meets the big beach. Yep. Yeah, right. Dave, do you want to introduce Mark? Sure. Um, Mark is, uh, is going to we'll move quickly, but uh, so I was just, okay. thank you very much, Amanda. The, the, um, it was great. That's a, Thompson Reuters big data meeting some of the big data needs on the outside. So. Um, Mark Winders is now going to talk about Contract Express, um, another cool company that uh, Thompson acquired. Um, one of the biggest issues that we come across in big data is companies grappling with their contracts, the drafting of them, the creation of them, the storage of them, the parsing of them, the understanding um, ties between and among them, um, the risks that they pose that are sort of sitting there undercurrents, and, and Mark's going to give us some a good primer on that, right, Mark? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's exciting to now be part of the Thomson Reuters family. It's a little bit of culture shock going from a 50-person corporation to a 60,000-person corporation, but it uh, it just offers phenomenal opportunities. So if we can look at the next slide, I'll. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how customers are using our products so that you might understand a little bit about big data and some of the challenges they're facing. 
if we look at this slide and we look at, uh, at corporations and the law firms, we see Microsoft on there, and that's certainly a big dog if you look at that, uh, that market. Microsoft has been a, a customer of ours for more than 10 years. Um, when we started talking with them, it was interesting. Every division had their own contract, and it was interesting because the global customers were using the contracts against Microsoft. They would take the best conditions from, say, the SQL division and say, we want to apply this to the Office division and the other products. And Microsoft, red-faced, had to give in to that because it was part of their company. And so they've crafted a solution with uh, Contract Express that produces uh, uniform contracts in 39 languages. So it's pretty extraordinary they actually publish that onto a web page because their distribution network is so broad so that the people can pick the product and then they pick the language and they push the button and it produces a contract. If we look at Cisco, uh, Mark Chandler is a very forward uh, thinking, um, you know, uh, general counsel. Mark uh, really started off in a classic crawl, walk, run kind of scenario and, and Mark has been very vocal about how much uh, Contract Express has helped him manage both the risk but also save him millions in the, uh, in the area of, uh, of uh, uh, big contracts and, and big data. Um, so I want to just uh, hang on one second. My screensaver just uh, kicked in. So uh, of course when, they, when you're uh, uh, trying to fumble around. <laughs> All right, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to. Um... So, why don't we just go to the next slide and we can help you through that? We can tell you what's on the screen. Trusted self-service contract creation. Yeah, let me uh, let me talk to that slide and uh, and uh, um, what I wanted to to really talk about on this slide is is the fact that um, if we if we look at the uh, if we look at the right side of the slide, what we see is is the is the repository of that slide. Contract uh, Express is is a full contract lifecycle management product and. Uh, Part of what uh, what is extraordinary about it is the is that the creation coming from the templates really addresses one of the big challenges in handling contract big data. Part of that is really having very strong metadata. So if you look at that repository, what you need to recognize is that because Contract Express has a creation engine that is based on questions. Those questions create a structured metadata that, uh, that lands in the database. And so that's rather extraordinary because what it gives you is the contract and then it gives you 30 or 40 very strong structured uh, metadata uh, conditions that you have um, in the database. And that's part of managing the, the big data side of this. When we, uh, when we look at the other side of the diagram, we see the creation side, and that's really where um, I think Thomson Reuters loved Contract Express and purchased us. We have the best templating technology in the business. That template is built around Word. It uses very simple markup, and, uh, and, it's ex and it really helps you um, understand uh, um, really what uh, those questions then give you the, those, that very good structured metadata. If we look at the first arrow coming off of that, um, we really talk about the fact that a, a template would be built by the legal department of a corporation. And, uh, and that's really part of what is, is unique about the Contract Express approach. We have the only product in the industry that really can be run in its entirety from the legal department and, uh, and doesn't need to have um, an IT interface that's helping with the programming of those templates. So that, uh, that process, um, if you look and, and see that it can, uh, it can 
uh, talk about uh, the standard clauses and whenever you get outside of standard clauses and all of a sudden you're, uh, you're wanting to get approval for this process, um, the questions can really be uh, routed directly to the departments that apply to those questions. So, uh, you know, a question can be related to revenue recognition and immediately go to the finance department. And I think that's important to, uh, to recognize as you, uh, as you look at that. If we go, if we go to the next level down, we see the, the arrow going down to the lawyers and uh, negotiation part of the, the process. And that really recognizes that um, we are all going to have contracts coming in from outside that are not created on our paper. The, the nice thing about Contract Express is the business person that's putting that in, the second they identify that this is a third-party contract, they can then be driven to collect a, a minimal part of metadata, but they're going to collect some structured part of metadata to make sure that when it lands in the, the repository, um, that it has, um, you know, a good set of metadata that can be used for searching and, and alerting people from, you know, expiration dates and all the things that go and surround that, that, uh, that part of the process. So it's really pretty extraordinary. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark, to be mindful of, to be mar mindful of time, if you, if you want to key yeah. takeaways in terms of, of a contract life cycle management. Obviously, we, we, you, we're happy to talk to people in more detail yeah, about, yeah, I think about that, that yeah, tool. Let's, uh, let's go what, that. what are the key takeaways from a, from a, so how do we line up the people and the process part with this technology? Well, it's really, uh, I think uh, the, the main thing when we start with a corporation is we really need to talk about the people, the process, and, and the, you know, the data that's, that's surrounding this, and certainly legal managed services becomes a part of that. It's, uh, it is all about uh, automating a, a contract that can, uh, can get a lot of leverage with, with the folks out there. Um, it's about speeding up that process and doing more for less. So I think if you're showing that uh, that next slide, we talk about uh, you know the benefits that come out of this and, and why corporations use it. We also have uh, we also have the speed of which people can respond to uh, to that process. Um, Mark Chandler talks about the fact that they've grown 400 percent in the 10 years that they've used Contract Express. And he said that uh, that they have not had to add anybody to their contract review staff, and I think that that's uh, that tells us a lot about what Contract Express can offer to that environment. The last uh, last point on that slide is really uh, about uh, you know taking the human errors out of that process, and that's really Contract Express, for lack of a better term, is a robotic process, and that means that it's going to surround it with, uh, with a structured process and a compliance portion of the product that is really, uh, is really important to managing uh, a very unstructured uh, format of information within corporations. So I'm not going to go Boy, that, uh, isn't that isn't that, Mark, isn't that the key from a big data standpoint that has changed significantly. It's not just getting the contracts. I remember when a big issue for contracts was the lawyers are sitting on, they're not, they're not moving them through quickly enough. And that's certainly, <laughs> a, I'm sure, a complaint that resonates still today. But the data and analytics that come out of these, um, what on an individual basis may not be a big deal, um, when you do it cumulatively, adds up to significant um, stuff yeah. that the company is putting out their risk and obligations. Is, have well, you seen that, exactly. re, that on the risk side, have you seen that more underscored since you've been in the space? Yeah, I think you really have the ability for somebody to, to look at a clause that may have been inserted into a contract and say, that has now become a problematic clause. Which contracts have that? Because of the structured metadata that Contract Express puts into the, uh, into the repository, it really allows you to quickly say, okay, we've got 16 contracts that we have to amend in order to get around that problematic clause that may have been in that contract. So it's all about managing that risk and, and being able to get to the data so that you can mitigate that risk as quickly as possible. So, uh, so yeah, yeah I'll, and, leave it, and I'll leave it at that and you can go ahead. 
No, thanks, Mark. And 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 we've certainly gotten a bunch of questions, um, and I'm going to address a couple that have come up here in the program. But before then, just sort of tying together the people, process, and technology components of this sort of Thomson Reuters phase. And again, these are um, three or four um, offerings that we've talked about. We have we've acquired over 200 businesses in the last 15 years. So you can imagine we have a lot of big data, a lot of other big solutions that we're not touching here today. Um, the, the reason why I thought we thought that these were interesting is also how contracts relate to regulatory changes. So in in, in many organizations, these would be siloed. Um, so you'd have people handling compliance and regulatory uh, information, and then you'd have your contracts group doing things separately. Well, if there's a change in a regulation that impacts a policy, a procedure, um, uh, a way of doing business, a business line, a business, uh, uh, something you're bringing to market, um, many uh, we've seen many companies get in big trouble not connecting those dots. Um, and uh, so, so Mark, I'm sure that uh, you're seeing in, with Contract Express uh, that relationship of this, what, what used to be its own sort of function, the contract function, and how it ties into the greater enterprise. Like, what the heck do we do with all this information that's flowing around? And you've talked about capturing some of that. But I'm sure you're getting more questions now about the ability to update, um, to go across contract patterns and enterprises than you used to get. Well, and, and, and it's the ability for Contract Express to produce contracts in, in 39 languages to understand that it's, it is now a global issue that, that companies need to be aware of. It is, is it, Microsoft saw it directly 10 years ago when they thought, well, our divisions all have their own contract until the global customers said, oh, we can use this against Microsoft. And I think it's, it's also the fact that you need to be aware of the regional uh, legal aspects that may come into that and having a system that can, can make sure those are all, always in compliance automatically. And I think that's the key, too. Right, and coming back to the theme of there's no magic bullet, um, you know, it would be wonderful. This has all appeared on a dashboard, and you just made a change to a contract that automatically did other things in sequencing. Maybe we'll get there one day. I hope we do. But in the meantime, you actually need people um, to look at that stuff and to tie that that information together. So tying back to what Danielle highlighted at the beginning of our conversation today is if you don't have a plan for this, if you're simply throwing contracts against the wall and you, you want to have the, you know, we have reseller agreements or VARs, or VARs and some companies have tens of thousands of these things. Um, we see this in the area of NDAs. Um, companies okay. don't know what they don't know. So visualizing and capturing that information um, is critical. When we, when we talk to, uh, about NEOTA, um, I know that Matt Gillis will touch on this as well, in terms of proactively designing things versus um, reacting and just sort of organizing. Um, there was a question we had earlier um, that it didn't get to during Amanda's presentation that I think applies across the board for everything here today, um, is how much um, of what we talked about um, is out of the box versus configurable or customizable. And that's a, it's a common question that you hear, especially when you have software and a service together. Uh, Amanda, if you want to talk about in relation to Clear, and then we can just open that up, and then um, sure. we'll move along to, uh, to Stephen. Yeah. Yeah, the good news is it is very much uh, out of the box today. Uh, that is probably the main use case. Uh, but at the same token, uh, the ability to do very sophisticated connecting via API keys, uh, you know, however you want to build it, in many ways, we're program agnostic, so I may be working with an account that has 1,700 users gathering live data directly in their portal that exists today. Uh, and at the same token, I might just have uh, like a large financial institution with 800 passwords to do due diligence research instantly for purposes of having protection from the regulatory environment for missing something. So the good news is the sky is the limit in this particular side of the world, but the, the starting point is typically out of the box uh, online access. Thank you. Um, and uh, folks, just hit the chat button there and send us your questions. Um, we are now well along in our journey, and um, I'd like to introduce Stephen Epstein. Um, Stephen's a, a, just a fantastic uh, mind here. He has senior positions within financial services institutions and um, has, has learned a lot about learning and learned a lot about big data uh, from many, many different contexts. And the people, process, and technology 
um, components. They're working at Digital Reasoning on some very cool things. And um, now I'll hand it over to, uh, to you, Stephen, and uh, take it away. Dave, thanks. That's great. Um, so, uh, Daniel, if you can move to the next slide. So just a little bit about digital reasoning to give everyone some context. Um, we've been around for close to 15 years, uh, but not within financial services. We, we got our start within the um, Intel sector uh, within DC, helping to find really bad people across really large data sets. And we're talking a lot about big data, and I think a lot of people on the call think big data has only been around for a couple of years. Big data has been around for a long time. Um, in the context of the federal government, big data has been around for decades, from communication data to all types of unstructured data. Um, the challenge facing anyone who wants to get to real knowledge and real insight from big data really hasn't changed um, over the past many decades. Um, we've been focused on that challenge, and we've developed some really interesting technology around cognitive computing, which I'll talk a little bit about, and I'll try and leave some time for my colleagues here. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what we're focused on is being able to go through large amounts of unstructured data, communication data is a great example, and not just organize it, but really find insights that drive important uh, change and um, also lowers risk within financial institutions, within hospitals and the healthcare industry, um, within government and the intelligence community. So if you go to the next slide, if you, if you think about data a little bit and you think about big data, um, we developed this slide for our clients because it, it essentially describes the challenge that everyone in the industry is having around big data. And that is when you start to collect all your data and you, you build uh, a data lake, a reservoir, however you want to describe it, of all this great information, there are a lot of tools out there. Some of them were on that um, vendor landscape that Dave had up at the beginning of this webinar that do a great job in terms of um, storing this data and organizing this data into information, into something you can query. But they don't really do a great job allowing you to derive knowledge from this data and ultimately derive real insight from the data. And if you want to have a real impact, and in the area of compliance, because we're talking about compliance, if you really want to lower false positives, if you really want to find true positives that have been concealed and can be damaging to your business, you need to get beyond information. You need to get to the core of the knowledge, and you need to get true insight. And to get to that insight, you need to understand the context of what your data holds and the understanding um, within that data. So you need technology that can understand context, that could understand the meaning of the data, and that is designed to drive business impact. That ultimately is how you will get to, your, to those insights that really will, will help you in your business. To do that, we believe you need cognitive computing. You need technology that really understands data and understands how to get you the data you want and the knowledge you need. So this slide probably will resonate with a lot of people on the call. And if you're in a financial institution and you've built your data lake and you have all your big data, the most natural thing you're going to do is you're going to take your current analytical capabilities, solutions you've purchased you know, over the past decade, and you're going to try and apply it to this data. A great example is email, chat. You'll likely use some of your analytical capabilities that can find keywords or lexicons. And you'll find some interesting information, but you're also going to raise a lot of false positives. And, and that really is the daunting task for any compliance officer. If you're interested in getting to the heart of your big data and you're really looking at things like chat and electronic um, communications like email or you want to get to the heart of a legal opinion or a narrative around a suspicious activity report, you need technology that can really understand the context of all this unstructured data. Current analytical technologies that are available within the financial institution typically don't give you that information you need. And you know, often what we find is new customers, they're looking for new analytical capabilities that can get to the heart of this information and can close what we call the knowledge gap. And that is really kind of deriving the true value from your big data um, while lowering false positive and lowering some of the operational costs around analyzing this big data. 
Um, Danielle, next slide. So a little bit about cognitive computing, and we're, we have, we're short on time, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, apart to say that many vendors have a different definition of cognitive computing. Our definition of cognitive computing is the ability for us to bring in all types of communications through natural language processing, um, the ability for the machine to learn from that data. So when you're going through the data, um, are you looking at someone who's talking about Apple the corporation, you know, Apple the fruit, Apple the product? So the data can tell you that, you know, listen to the data, understand from the data exactly what the data means, and from that, represent this information in a way that's contextually important to the people that are using the data. So when we organize the data and we start to contextually analyze the data, we're always organizing it in a way that a compliance analyst can actually see a true positive instead of a false alert. Um, next slide. Um, the only other point I'll make on this slide, again, because I want to leave us time to get to some Q&A and hand this over to Matt, is everything we do in digital reasoning, we do it um, in a way where we surface information to the right person at the right time. So if you're a compliance officer and you want to see a dashboard of all your compliance alerts across your electronic communications, we, we will raise alerts that are contextually um, developed and designed for you as a compliance officer. If you're a compliance analyst and you just want to see one alert and all the context around this alert, um, the platform is designed to surface that same information to you in a different way. So again, using cognitive computing, we have the ability to kind of go through all this electronic communications, all this unstructured data, and really organize it in a way where you see alerts that are meaningful to you, and we are essentially not surfacing alerts that have little value to the business. Um, why don't we skip this slide, save a little time. Um, slide 40, or it's a really important point, um, actually, Danielle, if you go back to slide 40, the big problem in compliance with big data is if you don't use the right tool to analyze this data, you end up with a lot of erroneous information, a lot of valueless information, uh, and that has two two net effects to your business. One is you're driving up costs around analyzing um, your big data and your unstructured data, and you're distracting your team from actually getting to real risks that you know, face your business. So everything we do within our platform, it's about really analyzing the big data and unstructured data in a way where we are reducing false positives and we are surfacing true positives as quickly as possible and routing it to the right person. So lowering cost and also lowering risk is a really important part about using cognitive computing in our space. Um, and last but certainly not least, there's a lot of different ways you can use cognitive computing. I, I think it was um, Amanda earlier you were talking about kind of doing some of that entity analysis around politically exposed people. So, you know, if you want to find out a lot of information about a person, um, you can use cognitive computing to basically mine the social web and the business internet and, you know, put someone's name in and really find out everything about them. Um, we work with a nonprofit organization called Thorn. Um, they were essentially established by Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore, and their mission is to find children who are being um, sexually exploited. They use our technology across, across law enforcement essentially to mine the Internet to find out exactly who's being promoted, potentially are they a child, and you know, do they need to be rescued? So this is just kind of understanding what people are doing and who they are and what relationships they have. Cognitive computing is really designed to get to the heart of that. And again, you can use this within banking, buy side, sell side. You can use this technology within healthcare to look at you know, um, clinical surveillance issues where there's a misdiagnosis and someone is facing a problem and they don't know about it. It's just the ability to kind of use technology to get to the heart of big data and to drive outcomes that previously were unknown is a big part of what we do at Digital Reasoning. So there you go. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a mouthful, as they say, in about eight minutes, seven minutes. Um, and it's, uh, it's amazing technology. I, I encourage people to take um, to contact Stephen and, and, and really go deep with this stuff. One of the things that is a theme, and, I, and I've, we've got a bunch of questions I'm going to come to, but one of the things that's a theme is that uh, we find that companies are still doing the go and fetch um, work when you have tools like this that can actually capture and, and sort through um, this information. There, there are still companies that um, are doing it the old-fashioned way, and 
Um, what I would encourage companies to do in relation to big data and people process and technology is to use these kinds of tools. And we're going to come up and talk about how you plan your business uh, with Neota, but but in some of the even some of the things that that we um, work on our people and process technology stuff at Thomson Reuters is we find in-house groups still doing things very inefficiently with expensive people, and they burn out, high turnover, they hate what they do. In the example that Stephen is just talking about, in e-communications within regulated institutions, um, the noise factor is enormous, a lot of false positives, especially with older technologies. And um, uh, the magic bullet doesn't yet exist. You still need judgment. You still need people looking at the output from a digital reasoning. Um, so our team, for example, the, our legal managed services team, will work in conjunction with digital reasoning to actually sort through what, what does get kicked out. But, but there's no reason um, for you in-house to be doing the go and fetch and doing all that work on your own when you can do cost effectively and better, frankly, um, using a combination of the, the people process and technology. Um, uh, going back, I've uh, got some questions from uh, from prior uh, folks within the, the, the presentations today. Um, one of them relates to having access um, through um, Contract Express, Mark. Um, can, can third parties have access? In other words, if you have outside counsel or other <coughs> folks outside audit, can they look at the system and can they be given permission to do that? And yes, absolutely. And contracts and, so you can have participants in that ecosystem. Yes, absolutely. It is a it's a web-based application. As long as they have a valid login, they could be a full participating member in the in the process. Whether it's reviewing um, legal edits or whether it's actually participating in uh, in uh, pushing it through in some level of the approval cycle. It's a great question on a number of fronts because in terms of the workflow, that's one level. But also we've talked, we've heard visualization come out several times during today's uh, discussion. It's to me the single biggest gap. It's hide, most things are hiding in plain sight um, and you can't find them. And these contracts, you know, people do them in cubby holes and um, they, there may be consistent themes. And if you're using outside counsel or if you're using, for example, our team, we have a, a group that works with contract lifecycle management um, more cost effectively than many outside counsel. Um, and if, if we have access at the same time in real time to the same information, better decisions will be made. It's all about that. The way to reduce risk is to make better decisions. Um, the way to improve your business um, um, is to reduce risk and to reduce the drag on the organization. And having the ecosystem available as Contract Express does, to be able to do that in real time is great. Um, one of the other questions relates to due diligence um, under CLEAR. And, um, and one of the questions is, can you identify beneficial owners? Is it just limited to uh, what's publicly available or does it go beyond that? So. Amanda, if you could uh, pop on Yeah, there. well, that that could be our, an entire conversation at, at banking events. That is often my entire uh, WebEx, uh, the keys to beneficial ownership today. The truth is this really is where analytics come into play. So we go, we look at public records and, frankly, probably proprietary Thompson Reuters, you know, business data, but we make instantaneous connections on perhaps someone say, sharing the same phone number as that company or I can give you an example of a real estate investment trust I was actually looking up recently. Um, through our analytics component of our product, we found the 197 similarly situated REITs all sharing various ownership connections. And they had a problem with one of those REITs, so they naturally probably wanted to know about the other 197. So that's really where uh, analytics algorithms, that truly is changing. Um, that beneficial ownership issue. But the truth is, you know, a closely held Delaware business with no information but for a corporate filing with no information whatsoever on it, you know, that's hard to go from, but we cross reference billions of records to give clues. So it's probably the main driver. A lot of our conversations today are, um, are you doing what you can to, to vet a company to see who's really under the hood there? Great. So we'll we'll defer on the more detailed answer uh, for a one-on-one -on, -one on that. It's a, thank you for that. Um, I want to make sure that um, we get Matt Gillison, and then we'll come back to some additional questions. Um, I'm having difficulty seeing the chat part, but uh, so 
Uh, if somebody can, we'll get them, and I'll make sure to um, ask them if I if I get them ahead. Uh, Matt um, also uh, tremendous experience in the industry in the industries. I should say he's been at this a long time, um, and um, has come up with truly a better mousetrap um, on how to leverage expertise using. You know, this this infamous artificial intelligence and so um, a great guy um, feel free to chat with him offline um, uh, Matt take it away and then we'll come back with some questions at the end and wrap up thanks Dave and as you can see from the the screen here I, I am a frequent speaker as it says Ryerson University so uh, this is a topic of interest I think to many of your colleagues globally and, uh, and we talk about it quite a bit but I meant for that to say Thompson Reuters here um, Danielle can you move to the next slide please so I want to talk a little bit about who Neotologic is and what we do. And I think everything we've talked about today really builds to our core strength. So most of what we've talked about today are probabilistic technologies. They're going to identify buckets of information and categorize it for you in a far more efficient way than human beings going through it or a process-driven flow. What we do is we take the outputs as interpreted by your most expert people and we turn those into automated self-service products for compliance. So we are a drag and drop platform that enables you to create intelligent software applications to automate your expertise and your processes at internet scale. Our applications do two main things, right? They take your most expert people's analysis and project that out to your broader audiences and they automate repetitive administrative tasks. The example I like to use is TurboTax because nearly everybody's at least heard of it, if not used it. TurboTax and Intuit hires hundreds of tax professionals to analyze a complex federal and state tax code, and then they translate that into plain English language questions that you as an end user answer. Did you get married last year? Did you sell your home? And they only ask you those questions necessary to produce a 1040 at the end of your session. We do the same thing. So we have a blend of business processes, business rules, and document automation technologies running on a hybrid AI engine in the background that ultimately produces answers uh, to questions, advice, and documents. So for experts, we create leverage taking that expert skill and making it available to anyone at any time. And in the context of this group, uh, as you are GCs and chief compliance officers, think of this as having self-service compliance. And I'm going to go through a couple of example applications uh, that we've talked about today. One is in the context of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act compliance, and the other is in Dodd-Frank compliance. So as you see, our applications have four different functions and generally are hybrids of these different components. So conducting the perfect interview each time, as if your most expert person could interview one-on-one -on -one every single person in your organization, providing analysis and advice, document automation, and intelligent workflow throughout. Our compliance application types tend to be an expert in a box, so as I've said, providing expertise to all of your employees on demand, or internal guru type applications, guiding your less experienced staff, training them as if they were sitting with your most experienced staff to vastly increase efficiency. We take facts from users or data from systems, put them through our reasoning engine to drive conclusions, which are messages, documents, or emails, and then finally data to systems. So we can run from one database and push data into another using our hybrid reasoning engine in the middle, or we can take answers from questions much like TurboTax. It really is up to you and what is the most efficient way to deploy the platform in your process flow. Uh, Matt, just to, for a second, since I don't know any, I don't understand anything what you just said, and maybe others don't. When you say system to system, what, what does that mean? What would be a practical example of that? Yeah, sure. So if you talk about something like clear or digital reasoning telling you, here's a, this output as analyzed by an expert will tell us that this person falls into this category, you can pull that information from an upstream system and then automate your process on what somebody's supposed to do with that information. So think of us as bridging the gap between categories of information and decisions. 
right? So taking your least expert people and making them behave as if they're your most expert people and replacing what is now often a process-driven or paper-driven process where you're relying on training that happened one time or a manual for someone to, uh, you know, a, a less experienced end user to go consult a manual at the point of decision. And we know how that generally works out. This takes the risk out of that process puts your most potent expertise in the hands of your least expert people at the point of decision. And we can do the same thing in terms of outputs. We can give that person an answer, or we can push the answer into a database to be aggregated for trend analysis over time. So think um, something like self-service compliance in, in a conflicts checking application, right? You can see what activities are somebody in a large scale uh, technology business doing outside of your company, how many of them are in conflict with your current process so that you can analyze the process and decide whether you should change it over time. You know, how many people appeal? Uh, this is an application we've actually built uh, and cut the, the time that your lower level compliance people spend on repetitive questions by 75 to 80% while giving yourself real data to react to over, over the course of time. Great, thank you. My pleasure. So I want to give a couple of real-world examples. As I said, uh, one of these is in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, area, uh, and this was a, a system that we built, if you can go to the next slide, with Foley and Lardner, where they recognized a need in the marketplace based on that risk that we just highlighted of FCPA compliance vi violations and fines, particularly in mid-tier manufacturers who could not afford a chief compliance officer, uh, nor could they afford to pay a Foley and Lardner or another large law firm their hourly rates, but they had a real need and a real risk of non-compliance. So Foley and Lardner packaged up their advice and an automated system to provide both a risk assessment and curbside advice. So what you see here in the next couple of slides is a heat map. So analyzing based on answers to questions about jurisdictions where a company is doing business, type of products, et cetera, what their global risk of FCPA noncompliance is. You can go to the next slide, Daniel. So we'll start with, they have a curbside advisory component of this, which does two things. It acts as a perfect interview every time of a salesperson uh, who's going to do a transaction mostly overseas, uh, and it cuts down on the asynchronous communication that we're all familiar with. You know, the lawyer will ask the salesperson three questions, they'll get answers to one and a half of them, and that goes on for a week or two while they're emailing back and forth in the middle of each other's nights trying to get to the answer. This makes that a one-shot uh, interview that is driven by the prior answers to questions. So if they don't get a clear answer, it will drive to a deeper dive question to get better information so they can provide the right advice. And as you can see here, here's Foley and Lardner's explanation of what it does. Let's begin that question. Now, just, just to jump in here, uh, for those folks that are lawyers on the phone, I mean, this is an outside counsel, and we have a, a partnership as well, Thompson Reuters, with Neota and an outside firm. This is an outside counsel voluntarily giving up um, um, the, the, the old way and moving to the new way um, to, to handle sort of the challenge of big data, right, Matt? Exactly. It's, it's really... It's outside counsel say, saying, hey, there's a better way for us to provide these services to you and, and really to extend our reach to customers who are not current clients. You know, there's a market need that's unmet, and we're seeing that as an increasing driver of these types of, of packaged applications, you know, ad, packaged advice with uh, support of, of uh, partner hours uh, to help interpret unclear, you know, unclear answers uh, and really provide the bespoke services you want them to provide while packaging up the routine services that you might not be calling them at all to get an answer on right now. So very right, quickly, so this is not this is not left up to people who are geeks, you know, the big data geek folks, of which I am not. Um, we're talking about mainstream giant law firms. Absolutely. And we're really talking, as I said, about taking what comes out of your big data analytics and your most expert people's interpretation of those outputs and making them usable by your lowest level employees who have to make decisions every day, right? In the individual instance, 
a decision about whether to go forward with a small transaction might not be all that risky, right? But in the aggregate, if you do that over hundreds of instances where you're relying on somebody's ancient training to get to the right answer, that creates significant risk in the aggregate uh, that can lead to, to fines and worse. So just very quickly going through this, you can see we're collecting basic information about the transaction. So this is a meals and entertainment. The system has helped throughout it. Go to the next screen, Danielle. And that can be as voluminous as you want it to be. It can link to outside sources. But here you see a description of what the FCPA around, uh, rules are around meals and entertainment. The ability to add in multiple people at a dinner, so real world scenarios, instead of having to ask that question one on one, the system will ask the questions to get to the full uh, picture of the facts. A, a follow on series of questions about with whom are you doing business? Is it a government of, uh, official? Or is that government official going to be reimbursed? And what's the value of what you're giving them? And then you get to an answer relatively quickly. Uh, most of the answers in this particular system are, are calibrated to be fairly risk averse, meaning they're going to say, hey, you ought to consult with a Foley and Lardner attorney. They're actually building V2 of the system right now to provide more clear answers where the facts are clear enough cut to do that. But that's entirely up to you how you want to calibrate risk in the system. So the second and, application. And Matt, do you want to talk about our collaboration and how you're getting information on our project, um, the, the actually underlying data, the research that, that um, helps you populate these answers? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think that's uh, you know, in line with our theme today of, of uh, people, process, and technology. Um, we're uh, in the midst of, an app, of a project with uh, Ackerman uh, and Pangea 3, the Thomson Reuters uh, LPO uh, provider, uh, where Pangea 3 is doing the primary research and updates on a 50-state survey for data privacy data breach reporting requirements, which will ultimately be extended into information governance and records retention. Uh, and Ackerman is providing the, uh, the editorial advice and, and ultimately um, the overseeing the whole process in terms of what should the logic path be to, to answer you know, what is a simple but very pressing question when you have a data breach? You know, do I need to report the data breach based on the fact pattern, how it happened, and the types of data involved? Um, if so, to whom and in what format, right? And generally, if you're a consumer business, you're going to have data from people in all 50 states, and say you're a target, um, that could have been breached. And you need to know very quickly, do I need to report this to somebody? And if so, to whom and in what format, right? And what we're working on with Pangea and with, um, with Ackerman is to provide an automated uh, self-service version of that, what would otherwise be you know, a 500-page PDF uh, that, that you have to pour through to figure out what the state of the law is and match that up against your facts. We automate both halves of that and enable you to get ex to the perfect answer uh, in a very rapid uh, period of time, which those of you who are GCs uh, in this space understand when your CEO is, is yelling and saying, I need to know an answer right now because we're, we have to get in front of this with the press. Um, it's a bit of magic to be able to say, I can provide you that answer. I can tell you that in Georgia we need to report and in Kentucky we don't and here's why. Uh, and, and automating that, I think, is really a stroke of genius, uh, as well as using Pangea 3 to do the primary research and upkept to keep that research at a fraction of the cost of doing it in-house. Right. And just to, just for the listeners, it's uh, Pangea 3 is the uh, legacy name for legal managed services, which uh, Danielle did the overview of earlier. Um, it's the same thing. So, so as we not confuse you with another data point in big data. Uh, yeah, these kinds of, I, I, I think, to underscore this, um, a lot of people, when they go out to the market to look at these kinds of solutions, if you go to a legal tech, which is just amazing, like a, like a circus, um, people go out and they'll look for a point solution here and there. They'll say, okay, Neota can help me with this, and Digital Reason can help me with this, and Thompson Reuters can help me with this. My strong advice in this is help weave it together. As Matt mentioned, you know, um, if you're working with digital reasoning on, on let's say, unstructured data in e-communications and you're trying to convert that into something that's usable along the lines of what Neota is talking about, um, I, bring people together. Bring us in the room with you. It doesn't cost you anything to talk about these kinds of things, uh, unlike with some consultants. We don't charge for that. Um, and 
the better solutions come from better information. So big, you know, there's big data and then there's sharing of information. And my experience with a lot of companies is they lack time. And, um, and I'd like to hear, you know, Stephen and, and Matt, your reactions to that as well. You know, they lack time, but often procurement um, runs the process and they think that their goal is to, their number one job is to save money. when in fact, they're not linking pieces. So Stephen, I know that we've talked about that in conjunction with our collaboration. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dave, what we're, what we're seeing is just, you know, there's obviously a learning curve to the buying cycle. Um, but at the end of the day, when the business is faced with the problem of facing some of these emerging regs like Dodd-Frank here in the U.S. or Mara or MIFID II in the U.K. and Europe and the whole notion of reconstructing a trade or being able to understand, you know, which which traders or employees could be putting the firm at risk um, or creating pre-trade transparency uh, dashboards as part of meeting regulatory requirements, the, um, the buying cycle actually accelerates pretty quickly because it's a daunting task. Like, if you recognize you don't have the right technology to analyze this big data, then you recognize you have to do something and you have to do it quickly. So um, as you know, slow as a procurement process can be, we're finding just so many more businesses recognizing the challenge they face around mining this big data. And when they find a technology that can get it right, um, they seem to be really motivated to act quickly. Yeah, and we see that generally they're spending these dollars one way or another and often not very efficiently. So if you can replace what would be an additional headcount or what would be a budget for updating a 50-state survey and turn it into something that's more useful at the point of decision, it's money far better spent and it ends up having a multiplier savings effect. Yeah, and that's a great point, Matt. Um, one we haven't talked about before, which is cost and and true cost. One of the things that we see when we go into a client, they'll say we're spending X with a vendor on Y problem in that creates data or needs to get data. And it, they, they're not really capturing the full cost, so they don't count. We were, we were talking with a, a large bank that had 30 people, uh, lawyers, in-house uh, in New York City at great expense, and nice building, by the way, very good views, um, manually extracting, going to websites of the various regulators that affected the business, um, capturing the information on a daily basis, um, creating Excel spreadsheets, and sending those regulatory changes around. And I see this played out company to company to company. Um, when we talked about price, they said, uh, well, yours is X, and you know we only have this in our budget. And I said, well, what is the cost of 30 lawyers in New York um, to do this? And one, it must drive them crazy, I would think, um, uh, because I don't think that's why you went to law school. Um, but also, it's, there's a real cost, and they hadn't factored that in. So a data point, sort of proactively, especially for compliance and legal folks that we see, is they'll tell us they don't have budget. And I don't think they've made the case strongly enough to use the data and analytics about what they're actually spending throughout the enterprise, not just in the legal function. So for contracts, I'm sure, um, uh, Mark, you come across the, you know, these large contracting groups. There's a cost to that for people hunting and pecking and chasing this information down. Is that, I would imagine that factors into your client's analysis of, of, of automating the contracting process. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Cisco has been openly talking about the fact that, uh, you know, 10 years of growth, 400 percent, and that to be able to do that without adding any additional staff really talks about doing doing it efficiently with, you know, without uh, needing extra people. So that's, yeah, that's an important component of what we offer. Yeah, we, we don't have a, a client or discussion with a company in any of our big data sessions where everybody has an open-ended a budget to add more people, and uh, I d I've done a presentation called um, uh, "Bigger is Not Better, Better is Better," and I think what we've tried to cover here in a in a little less than an hour and a half is better ways. They're not perfect, by the way. Um, they still require a lot of hard work, and one of the questions we have is, you know, what's the time to upload information? Um, so there are a lot of specifics that I'm sure you'll have in relation to what we talked about. We're happy to go through that. 
the, the fact is, as I said at the beginning, the status quo just isn't getting it done for any company that we're aware of of any size. And visualization, the ability to get at this information, using intelligence and algorithms and the kinds of things that digital reasoning, um, NEOTA, and our own internal TR um, solutions offer is, you know, these are all, you know, weapons for you to leverage. Um, and um, my, I'm a firm believer that you need to know about what's out there to do something about it. And um, if your management has their head in the sand and they think legal compliance functions are back office, well, they're back office. <laughs> um, these are these are front office issues now. And um, if you don't use the combination of people, smart people, uh, some, with some kind of framing, as, as uh, Danielle, her analogy to the to the to the farming and to you know to getting hay. Um, if you don't map this stuff out, if you don't organize it in a way um, using brains, um, using some kind of intelligence, also using your past data and analytics to move forward on it, um, then you're you're doing yourself and your company a disservice. And I see that we're at about 22 after. Um, and I'm not having access to the questions. So um, anybody on our panel want to contribute something, a question, something that they've heard from from clients, et cetera, before we uh, do a wrap? Dave, this is, this is Stephen. I'd, I'd add one more point. Please. And um, I, I, think, I think the point was actually raised earlier by one of the panelists, and that is the expectation from the regulators and their examiners, they're changing. They're changing pretty rapidly. Um, you know, the status quo is no longer being accepted. Um, in our world where our technology is used quite a bit to monitor electronic communications, sampling has been the status quo for decades. And that's changing literally overnight where regulators are starting to talk about monitoring every single email and chat that takes place. So to your point, do you go out and hire a thousand compliance analysts? No, of course you cannot. Or do you have better processes and technology and tools to make your current compliance analyst far, far more productive so they can meet the regulatory demand and expectation while not consuming your entire operational budget from your compliance team? It's just expectations are changing. Technology is there to kind of keep up with the change. And people just have to start to kind of tie those two together quickly. And a lot of banks are starting to do that pretty rapidly. That's an yeah. excellent point. And one of the advantages of, of a Thomson Reuters in this is we're ubiquitous. Um, there isn't a company of any size that we don't have a relationship with in some fashion with one of our products or services, Westlaw, you name it. We're the number one provider of data and analytics to the financial services industry, insurance, et cetera. Um, so use us and leverage these kinds of sessions um, to get information and data about data and what are those trends? The, the, you're right. The regulators, they're, they're hip to this technology and to these tools as well. Um, and they are aware of the fact that companies can do a lot more today. So, Stephen, that's a great point. Matt, were you going to say something? I, I might have stepped on it. just going to build on that, that. I think having a compliance for place is insufficient. You actually have to prove now that it, that it meets the mark in terms of, of being able to deliver compliance. So um, we're at time. I think uh, we could go on for a lot of this. We'll have, a, we'll have other sessions. Um, thank you for folks in attendance. The recording um, is available, and we'll, be, we'll send information to those who participated and for those who couldn't make it, uh, which there are many. Um, you'll be able to share this with your organization, and please feel free to send us along questions. And um, I want to thank um, Danielle for orchestrating everything and for all the participants uh, for doing a terrific job. We covered a lot of ground in a a short period of time. We know it was a lot of slides and a lot of stuff, but uh, we wanted to make sure that you were aware of some of these things, and we can drill down on these and others. So thanks again to everybody for, for their uh, uh, listening and for their participation.